The following talk is offered freely to ensure that no one is ever denied access to these practices and to these teachings. If you feel inspired to make a donation to support this offering, you can go to my website at jonathanfaust.com. While you're there, you can also sign up for a monthly newsletter designed to support you in your practice. Thank you, and enjoy. So normally in my life, I, I paddle on the Potomac every day. It's a big part of my life. And as you may well know, this has been the wettest year in recorded history. So the river's been at floodplain, and I haven't been paddling. So I was looking for another, another form of workout that I could do, and I got really interested in, in, the, in functional movement, which are kind of floor exercises that really hit a lot of core you know, core muscles, and it's all, you know, squatting and crawling and things like that. And, and I uh, got excited about, about rehabbing, you know, a wrist and things like that. So I kind of threw myself into this program and was making really, really great progress and, and learning for a while until I hurt myself. And then I had to stop. And then when I'm not exercising, I can just feel this downward spiral, you know. So I was feeling sorry for myself and, uh, and just, you know, thinking, well, maybe I won't, maybe I just won't try anymore, you know, <laughs> all of that stuff. And then I remembered, uh, it flashed in my head, uh, if, has anyone ever done a meditation retreat with S.N. Goenka? Anyone here? Yeah, a few folks. Survived, you survived. Congratulations. Ten days, ten hours a day. Really, really rigorous. And uh, in, in these long sits, you know, and these are quite often, well, once a day you do what's called the, the, the sitting of strong determination, the aditan meditation, where you sit with the intention not to move a muscle for an hour, and uh, potentially liberating, but mostly excruciating. <laughs> but, it, but he had a voice, he would talk like this. <clears throat> and uh, in the middle of a meditation, you'd just be sitting, and then you'd hear his voice say, start again, start again over and over for 10 days. So I just heard that voice start again. I thought, okay, I guess I got to start again. Have you ever started something with great enthusiasm and lose your focus? No? <laughs> That's what I'd like to talk a little bit about tonight. The, the art of starting again. Because it's something we have to get used to, because we always traditionally lose, lose our focus. So I'd like to talk about one of the foundations of meditation, which is building concentration, which is not sexy, you know, very, very powerful, but it's, it's a, a quality of willful discipline practice. I'd like to talk a little bit about about the benefits of concentration and also some of the consequences of not focusing in your life. Talk a little bit about the power of resilience and what it means to sort of use your resilience and focus on what you really want in your life. You know, quite often we're, when we're meditating here, you know, in, in warmer months, you know, we'll all be treated to the sound of a motorcycle going by, you know, at 90 miles an hour. And um, <clears throat> whenever I hear a motorcycle go screaming by, I, I kind of shake my head. Um, mostly because I, I really can't believe how many years I spent on a motorcycle and the fact that I'm still here. Um, I've, I've definitely hurt myself over, uh, over the decades of my love affair with motorcycles, uh, 
pretty deep scar uh, in one leg and a wrist that doesn't quite work right from uh, the tail end slipping out in a curve. And if you've ever ridden a motorcycle, um, you know why it's so addicting. It's the closest thing to flying. And in order not to die, you have to really pay attention. And there's something about concentration and flow that you experience on a motorcycle that is really, really fun. And concentration is a doorway to flow states. It's the key to really finding absorption in whatever you're doing. And you can even argue it's the key to happiness is your capacity to enter into that flow state. And what I've noticed is it's easier to pay attention on a motorcycle than it is in meditation. And as so many people have said to me, you know, when they find out I teach meditation, they say, you know, I love yoga, but I hate meditation. Now, the practice is the same, but when you're, when you're in tricking us and holding on for dear life, it's really easy to be in the moment. But when you have this task of tracking the in-breath and the out-breath, it's so subtle and it can be kind of infuriating sometimes. But the training that you get through developing concentration is extraordinary. You really, when you're practicing meditation and you are learning how to recognize when awareness is not here and bring it back and re-engage, there are a couple ways to look at it. You could say that when you're lost in some thought form or some fantasy, there's some element of stress in that. So when you are aware of that and you come back and you re-arrive, you've let go of something. You let go of, of the story or you let go of that emotion of just for a microsecond. But every time you come back, you've also reinforced who you are as the one who is aware. You reinforce this, this sense of, of really being in the seat of the witness, your capacity to observe without judgment, which is the difference between reacting to life and your capacity to respond to life. So concentration is really powerful. It's focused, staying on one point. And what that requires is that you notice when you're not on point and you start over. And that's pretty much what the practice is is learning how to notice when you're not present, coming back and starting over. So I'd like to talk a little bit about, about what occurs when you can really cultivate this capacity to concentrate. But I thought it might be interesting to practice a little bit. When you're, when you're practicing something like yoga or tai chi, your anchor is, is somewhat gross. That is to say, the sensations are really strong, so it's easier to stay present to those sensations because they're very, very dominant. And in the practice of meditation, the practice gets more and more subtle. So you're training your attention to, to really pay attention to the subtlest of sensation. And it can seem impossible but with practice and persistence, you can actually begin to cultivate more of a sense of what's called access concentration, of really accessing the moment through, through one-pointed attention. So generally, we explore different anchors. There's the anchor of the breath. For some, the anchor of sound is a little bit more accessible. Some people find the anchor in the palms of the hands or the soles of the feet to be helpful. Walking meditation, you know, the anchors on the sense of the body moving through space or, or the, the placement of the feet on the floor, like that's your focal point. But I'd like to, like to guide a little, little practice on breath and just to, give, just to offer a sense of how, how subtle it can be. 
quite often when you're training in, in the jhanas or the concentration practices, uh, you're bringing your attention to the breath. And rather than on the belly, where the sensations are a little bit more gross, you know, you can really feel the belly rise on the in-breath and fall on the out-breath, you bring your attention to the nostrils. And then there's an even subtler way you can explore sensation there. So if you like, you can close your eyes. And just to move from the gross to the subtlest, you might bring your attention to the rim of the nostrils and now inhale slowly to the count of four. And exhale slowly to the count of four. Inhale. Exhale. Now for the, about the next minute, if you would, counting in and counting out to the count of four, let your attention just flood into the experience of the breath as, as you sense it here at the rim of the nostrils. In strict concentration practice, when you notice your mind not on point, don't investigate it, just bring it back, right on task. And now, if, if you can, release the counting. Let the breath be free-flowing and effortless. But see if you can sustain your attention here at the rim of the nostrils. How intimately can you detect the subtlety of what's changing and shifting here? You're sensing the breath inside the nostrils. Now we're going to explore an even subtler distinction here in the practice. And that is to Notice if you can detect the breath outside the nostrils. You might sense just below, a little patch of skin just below the nostrils or the outer rim. Is it possible to sustain your attention here? And now release the technique. Just relax and feel. Can you sense any shift inside, any imprint from this practice? Just notice the quality of presence. And then if you like, you can now deepen your breath. And, and if you like, you can open your eyes or you can remain with them closed. You may have felt that as a practice in frustration. Or you may have felt some kind of a shift, maybe a little bit of calming, perhaps. This aspect of meditation, of concentration, or, or f developing focus is, again, it's not particularly sexy. It's, it's kind of hard work. When I've done month-long retreats, uh, inevitably I have some question that comes up <laughs> along the lines of like, 
why am I doing this? <laughs> you know, day 17. And then, but there's always this recognition of, I'm training my awareness. I'm training my awareness to stay. And when you can begin to develop concentration and move from the distractions, there are, are deeper states of, of presence that are available. And I'd l love to offer a talk sometime on, on what are called the jhanas, the, the, the access states of concentration. Uh, I've experienced some of them in meditation, and they're, they're amazing. It's amazing what occurs when all outside movement of the mind is removed and you become more and more and more absorbed in the inner experience. And we've all, I wouldn't say we all, but many of us have had those experiences. You know, just like the, the mystical experience of, of absorption. And we can cultivate this through, through training. And a lot of good comes out of it. You, you learn how to sustain your attention. You can calm the mind when it gets disturbed. You can move to deeper levels of awareness. You're strengthening your capacity to witness rather than react. You're learning how to disidentify from the moment, but just to experience the raw data of what's here. And it sets the stage for deeper inquiry. You know, from this place of very, very deep presence, quite often, and I, I mention it quite often as a pointing out instruction in meditation, that there's sometimes this, this shift from being able to really sense the foreground of your anchor. That you, you're, you're deeply absorbed in the movement of the breath, but you can also begin to feel a widening and a broadening of awareness. And you can sense kind of the flow kind of happening in the background. And that, that quality of witnessing and presence and allowing is quite extraordinary. So developing concentration in, in meditation is a, can be quite gratifying. But you're also training yourself to pay attention in life as well. And as you know, concentration allows you to accomplish and achieve a lot. Being able to sustain attention on a particular goal is a tremendous, tremendous skill. And of course, I think it's harder and harder to live a focused, one-pointed life these days with everything out there right now. I was reading about this study. Uh, a number of volunteers uh, agreed to have three cameras installed in their car. Um, one was a close-up on the driver's face. One was a broader view of the whole interior of the car. And then the third camera had the roadway out in front. And they were, they were focusing on the eyes. Like, where do the eyes go when you're driving? And they, what they notice is basically they're sort of like the short, you know, the, the short movement of the eye and kind of the long movement of the eye. And what they started noticing was, what is it that gets in the way of people staying focused when they're driving? And so they have all these charts of what people did while they were driving, which was dialing, answering, talking on the phone, eating and drinking and spilling food, uh, preparing to eat or drink, manipulating the audio system, smoking, reading, writing, grooming, distracted by a baby, distracted by children, distracted by passengers, distracted through conversation, and distracted by leaning and reaching as they're driving. I read this report, and it made me a little terrified to get into my car. Have you noticed how easily your mind gets pulled off a task? Uh, when I was working on this talk last night, I was doing a little Google research for something. And then later, I had this thought. Why am I reading an article about Brad Pitt 
at Jennifer Aniston's 50th birthday party. <laughs> I really don't care. But there I was. Oh my God. I just wanted to slap myself. Can you relate? The Google, I just, it'd be so interesting just to do a web browser history on everyone. Just to see where the mind, this, this drunken monkey of the mind, you know, where, where it goes. I met with an editor a little while back, a very well-renowned editor, to kind of pitch this book I was uh, excited about writing. And she was asking me, what, what, what kind of book? She, she's saying, well, is it more like a 50,000-foot view, sort of like a philosophical, or more like a, like a, a how-to, a runway book? And I said, it's going to have to be a how-to runway book because I, I don't have the attention span to write, to even let alone write a 50,000 book, but read a 50,000 book. I said, I don't know what's happened to me, but... You know, I used to love reading long books, and I, I can't sustain my attention. I was so surprised and pleased that she said, me too. You know, she said, I just don't have the patience to, to read anything long anymore. And I think it's happening to us as a culture. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, when you're, when you're gathered around the fire with your little tribe, it's really nice to have the guy who's going to get distracted by the twig snapping because it might be the guys over the hill coming to, to kill you. You know, the, the distracted mind is very tied into your survival mechanism. You know, awareness is designed to keep you alive. So it's just scanning for possible threat. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. However, when that capacity of mind dominates, where it will leave you is feeling profoundly dissatisfied because the mind is never able to rest on one thing. And so we get distracted from our focus all the time. And there are a couple of reasons why. One obvious one is there's so much competition for your attention right now. Quite often, we're not really clear what we really want. So we'll get distracted by, we'd, our filter isn't very clear. So we don't have clear goals or we don't have clear accountability. Or we're not tracking what's most important. Or we, you just have too much responsibility. So you're, you're trying to keep too many plates spinning in your life. So distraction is part of the makeup of your brain. And if you want to get focused, it becomes something to really look at how, how you can work with that. If you want to accomplish anything in life, you have to come back to discipline and focus and your capacity to start again in, in anything you're doing. And what it comes down to in many ways is, is building your resilience. One of the really cool things about where I lived in West Africa when I was in the Peace Corps I was in the capital city of, of Niger in Niamey, and it was right down the street from the Cirote Nationale, where everyone had to check in either after they crossed the Sahara or before they crossed the Sahara. And I had a big, uh, I had a, a, a big house, and I didn't own anything, so I would oftentimes just meet people, and, and they'd stay at my house for a while. And there were so many interesting people, but in particular, once... There were three uh, people, they were Brits, and they had just finished their four-year volunteer service down in South Africa. They were living in the mountains. And they were driving a, a Volkswagen van uh, from South Africa. They'd driven all the way to West Africa. And they were going to cross the Sahara and drive home. 
And they ran into some visa problems and ended up staying for maybe, maybe 10 days or so. We got to know each other pretty well. This one fellow told me, told me his story. Um, he was teaching way up, way, way up in the mountains, and he was visiting a friend of his uh, who was doing research on gorillas uh, way, way out in the bush. And she was having some problem with her gas stove, you know, one of these, you know, basically a gas cylinder with a burner on top. So he was, you know, crouched down working on it, trying to, you know, clean out the, uh, um, clean something out when it exploded. And uh, he was exploded, you know, right, right at chest level. And you can imagine, you know, horribly, horribly burned and miles and miles and miles from anywhere. And he was still, was before he lost consciousness, she said, the only thing I can do that might save your life is to give you a tranquilizer that I use on the gorillas. So it's been, never been used on a human. And he said, do it. And he said, you know, he just drifted away. And when he came to, they had, they took him to, a, again, a very remote hospital run by Catholic nuns. And he was completely, his whole body was, was wrapped. And he was immobilized for quite a long, long time. So he, you know, food was brought to him and fluids were taken away and... Uh, weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks without being able to move. And they began to take some of the bandages away so he had some limited movement. And then one day the nuns said, oh, he was waiting for his meal and he kind of rang the bell and uh, the nurse, the nun came and said, if you want to eat, you're going to have to eat in the cafeteria from now on. And he, he hadn't moved in months. And he said he swore up and down and had to drag himself to the cafeteria to eat and just railed and railed and railed against uh, the treatment that he was, that he was receiving from these, uh, these uh, <laughs> really tough nuns. And over time, he began to develop his strength. And, and then just spoke of how uh, this incredible awe he had for, for these nuns who, who kind of forced him into moving again. And when I think about the resilience he had to call on when kind of all was lost, it really gives me some hope. It gives me, it's a pretty good comparison when I'm moaning about, you know, a little ache and pain that gets in the way of me doing what I want. So I'm really grateful for, for that, that story and for meeting him. A lot of the research, you know, that's showing up now of really looking at what it means to be successful in life. There's no doubt that privilege and education is of inestimable value. But more than raw intelligence, uh, the key to success is resilience. And it all comes down to your capacity to regroup and to start again and stay focused on what you want. I've done lots of research in business school, and they did a whole study at West Point. Like, okay, what's the difference between people who graduate with success and those who don't? And it comes down to that resilience, the capacity to just pick up and keep going. So it comes back to this practice in meditation. 
And when your mind is completely hijacked, when you're emotionally hijacked, that moment of waking up, just that moment of realizing, wait a minute, this is a story. This is, this is, this is an emotion. I can bring myself back right now, right here, and start again. It can seem so small, but everything hinges on that. I was so fortunate to learn meditation when I was in high school. And it made such a difference in my life, from being really miserable to just kind of miserable. <clears throat> but it really did feed my, my creativity, and confidence began to flow. And, and again, there are many studies you know, with, uh, with younger minds that are developing the capacity of what this practice can do. It's, it's really quite inspiring. And quite often we have this sense that, that this concept that, that if you're successfully meditating, you are sustaining unbroken attention on an object. Like that's what successful meditation is. And we tend to think that the better meditations are the ones with fewer thoughts. And the, the bad meditations are the ones where your mind is, you know, the, the caffeinated squirrel. But certainly what we found in really looking at what happens in meditation, certainly there's benefit in, a, in, a, in absorbing moment-to-moment -moment attention on an object. But where the real benefit comes is when you notice you're not. It's the moment of noticing you're not on point that something happens inside. And again, it's like suddenly you are the one who is aware. You are the witness. <clears throat> and your capacity to come back is extraordinarily powerful. A friend was guiding a meditation a little while back, and, and he used this really, really cool instruction. I'd never heard it before. And he said that when you, when you notice your mind is off thinking, put a little smile on your lips. Because that, that little smile is really indicative of like a little celebration. You know, you just woke up out of the trance. That's, that really is a celebration there. So focus and concentration is really good. It's like you're designing a car. You know, you can build a really strong engine and a really strong transmission. But then the challenge is, what if you realize you're going down the wrong road? And I just like to talk a little bit about kind of the, the shadow of getting really concentrated. As we often say, or as I often say, there are a lot of very deeply concentrated people on the planet who are miserable. What concentration doesn't have is mindfulness, non-judging awareness. It doesn't necessarily have compassion. So kind of the, the complete practice in many ways is your capacity to stay focused and your capacity to observe without judging what you're experiencing. I like to think of it sometimes as concentration is the lens of the camera. You know, so with that you can zoom in, you can focus. And awareness is it's the chip or the film and that's that's recording. So it's very important to decide where you aim your camera. I've, I've shared a little bit about my kind of recent struggles in terms of where I'm going to focus my attention. And I was reminded of uh, years ago in talking with a mentor of mine, and I make, kind of made a big decision. I, I wasn't going to do this. And instead, I think I was going to do this. 
And he told me the story of the cheetah. He said, if you watch a cheetah chasing down a gazelle, the moment it recognizes that it's not going to catch the gazelle, it literally skids to a stop. They, you can see they, they, they put on the brakes and they skid to a stop because it realizes that it has to conserve its energy if it's going to get the next one. In that same way, it's so important that when you recognize something that you're engaged in that isn't wholesome, not going the direction you want, to skid to a stop. It's the power of the pause that comes in meditation. To gather your attention and then ask yourself, what is most important in my life right now? So this year I've changed directions a lot internally. You know, I decided last year I wanted to do a book, and so I kind of suspended the year of living mindfully, and I started working on the book, and then I realized, you know, I don't think I want to do the book. I think I want to take this year of living mindfully and do it online. There's this great opportunity. So I put all this whole thing together, and then I pitched it and went back and forth and then realized, you know, I don't think I want to do that online. <laughs> Because what I really love is being live and in person and, and doing something online and impersonal and being a talking head on a screen just wasn't that attractive to me. So I realized, well, I think what I really want to do is, is to do that live in person thing that I've done before. Which may be sort of an official announcement that I may be doing the Year of Living Mindfully uh, this year. But none of this would be available if I wasn't stopping and asking myself, what is most important? Where do I want to place my attention? And again, the back to that number one regret of the dying, that I wasn't true to myself that we all have to ask ourselves, what is the life that most calls me? And to, to know that, to have that sense, and then to engage so you can again sustain your intention on what's most fulfilling. And what that can lead to is a really deep sense of satisfaction. So I wanted to share uh, just a little bit, because I'm aware time is waning, there are just a few minutes left, that some really pragmatic things that have helped me around sustaining concentration, what I'm working. Because again, so many things are competing for your attention, particularly if you're working on a computer. You know, they're just things flashing all the time. The main thing to focus on is combating distractions. That's really the most important thing. So what I have found helpful and what a lot of science has shown, that it's really helpful to focus in short bursts. Like don't, don't expect that you can sustain concentration for a whole day or for a whole morning, but make it confined and then really focus. So what I have found, kind of inspired by the, the Pomodoro technique, is 25 minutes of undistracted time. And what I find is to clear my desktop or whatever I'm doing, clear all distractions. And some, of us, some of us get distracted visually and some of us get distracted by sound. So I have found putting on headphones for 25 minutes has really, really helped me a lot. And there's some very cool dual binaural beat programs that are designed to cultivate concentration. And uh, I'll send out some links in the email. Um, another website called Focus at Will that uses kind of like acoustic engineering to help you focus. That that can be very, very helpful. You know, work in short bursts. And even in, in meditation, you know, don't anticipate I'm going to sit for half an hour. 
I'm going to sit for 10 minutes undistracted and focused. You'll find that that could be more satisfying. Setting up some accountability so you're really tracking what's most important for you. Jerry Seinfeld realized that if he was going to get anywhere in life, he had to write his own material. And if he was going to write his own material, he had to write every day. So he developed this technique called the Seinfeld Method now, where you take a calendar, and when you do your task, you put a big red X, and you put it in public, so you'll be shamed if you don't do it, and you keep the visual chain going. And some people find that to be really, really helpful. The other thing that can be very helpful if there are things you want to cultivate in your life, and it's something uh, that I picked up from Tim Ferriss that I found very helpful. Uh, it's called the minimum effective dose. What is the smallest amount you can do that's going to give you the biggest bang for the buck? So I translated that from write 1,000 words a day to write something every day. Um, for a year, I wrote one haiku a day. And now my latest kick is I do one sketch or one cartoon every day, no matter what. Instead of, I'm going to do 30 minutes of yoga every day, which I would never do, I'm going to do some stretching every day. And what I find is just that little bit every day sometimes will inspire me to do more. But just doing the minimum keeps me engaged in a way that has really helped me to sustain some attention and some, some focus in my life. So when it comes to concentration, it's tremendously helpful. When it comes to building resilience, it makes a really big difference in your life. But kind of transcendent of all of that is to really ask yourself, what do you really want? What is it that you are aiming for in your life so you can put concentration and resilience and your capacity to start over into effect in a way that you is going to be most satisfying for you? Why don't we close with a short yet brief meditation? So once again, you might feel the breath. And you might, in these final moments, just to sense what most enlivens you in this life. What are the qualities that you would like to cultivate What are the practices or observances that would help you to sustain attention on that? And sensing who you are as the one who is aware. And sensing this balance of your capacity to focus, to hold attention on what's most important. At the same time, your capacity to observe without judgment. and ultimately to open to the mystery of this gift of your life. As you're ready, you can deepen your breath. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. Thank you for your kind attention. 
I believe I saw the cookie cart go by. So uh, if, if by any chance you'd like to, to help out with class to volunteer, uh, Bob is going to be there in the back. I'll be kicking around as well. We have no class next week. It's President's Day. So I'll see you in two weeks. Um, happy cookie, happy life. See you soon. <laughs>